Welcome to Social Dallas. Are you glad your face is in the place today? Do you like who you're sitting next to? I ask every time. If you don't, change your seat. Change your seat. I am uh, I'm so excited that you're here today. We have been really in, in an incredible and celebratory season at our church. We had a phenomenal Easter Sunday at the Windspear Opera House. Which, by the way, we'll be at the Winsboro Opera House next week. Next week. Gillies wasn't available, so if you show up here next Sunday, you're going to be by yourself. Uh, we're having church at Winsboro Opera House, 9 and 1130, so make sure you're there. And then we had our birthday turn-up celebration right after that. Two incredible services back to back. And then we took the last week off just to rest and get recalibrated. And all of our amazing serve team that serves so faithfully and diligently, we let them just chill. And I have to get up and set up chairs and tear down and tear up. Y'all don't know, it's hard out here for a church planner. Uh, this place is not set when we come here. We have to set it. And I want to actually shout out all our incredible serve team. Can you make some noise to them? If you serve in any capacity, can you just stand to your feet, all of our awesome serve team? Look at that right there. Y'all should be clapping louder than that, especially if you ain't on the serve team. You better thank God all these people standing. <laughs> Got up here early in the morning, doing all kinds of stuff, setting up, tearing down, even in the back. I don't know what was here last night, but there was a smell in the back. It was very relaxed in the first service, I'll say that. <laughs> so, thankful for our serve team. And... Uh, I'm excited to preach the word today. It's going to be real, real good. And I know you just sat down because you stand right back up uh, to honor the reading of God's word. I want to go to the gospel of Matthew today. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 15. I want to look at verses 21 through 28. The gospel of Matthew, starting at verse number 15. I'm sorry, chapter 15. We'll start at verse number 21 and we'll land at verse number 28. While you're looking at it on your paper Bible, you know you save when you got a paper Bible or your smart device or you're just going to look on the screen. Can I see your hand one more time if this is your first time here at social? Your first time here. Come on. Amazing. Amazing. Come on. I'm so glad that you're here. Hopefully somebody smiled at you today. If they didn't, they don't go to our church. We don't know them. We don't claim them. Uh, Matthew chapter 15. We'll start at verse number 21. And just to ooh, let you know before we read this, this is one of those passages of scripture that some preachers will skip and not preach from because it does not put our Savior in the greatest light. As a matter of fact, I've often said that if Jesus was walking the earth today, I am fully convinced he would have been canceled. Oh, he would have been canceled because your Savior was not politically correct. He did not come just to keep the status quo. How many you know he would turn some tables over? He disrupted systems of religion and tradition. He was ooh, a world changer, literally. And this is one of those verses where ooh, it's, 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 it's crazy, but it's still Jesus. And we're going to make it make sense by the end of it. But starting in verse number 21, it says, Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, oh, Jesus, why did you have to say this? Why couldn't you just say, be healed and go forth in peace? He said, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. If that was me, I would have been out right there. I might have punched the Savior in the face, actually. But not this woman. Look at how she flips what he says. Yes, it is, Lord. Yes, it is. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, girl, woo, you got great faith. 
Let me parenthetically pause right here and say that throughout the Gospels, there's only two people that Jesus commended their faith. A centurion who was a Gentile and this woman right here. Two people in all of Jesus' ministry that he ever commended their faith. Funny to me, he never commended the disciples' faith. <laughs> in fact, his staff, he was like, y'all got little faith and you need to level up. <laughs> But this pagan that did not even have a covenant with Abraham said, ooh, you got the faith. Be careful who you dismiss. Be careful who you think ain't got faith. Some of the folks that's doing all the Holy Ghost two-step and lifting up their hands ain't got no faith at all. And some of the people that might not look like they have faith externally, I'm thankful for a God who's able to look and perceive and who has the real faith. He says, woman, you got great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed six weeks late. Oh, my bad. New glasses. Hold on. Her daughter was healed two weeks. Some of y'all, okay. Her daughter was healed at, at that moment. Ooh, the rest of y'all get excited later. I appreciate that one little faint in the back. I want, to, I want to preach today, not long, using this as a title. I'm still not over it. I'm still not over it. Can we pray before we jump into this word today? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence. Speak to us so clearly today. When we leave here, let us not say that we were entertained. But God, let us say we were drastically changed by the power of your transformational word. Have your way. In Jesus' name, everybody say it. Amen. Everybody say it. Amen. You can be seated. Because you sitting down, I'm going to sit down too. Is that cool? <laughs> Y'all, something happened two weeks ago. I want to start off this sermon in vanity, but something happened two weeks ago that you need to see. I don't know how good our cameras are. I don't know if y'all can do a close-up. Can y'all do a close-up real quick? I need y'all to see something. This happened two weeks ago. Come real close, right over here. Do y'all see that? Do you see those gray hairs? Do you see? Y'all, two weeks ago, these gray hairs just popped on my chin. Two weeks ago, these, two, these three gray hairs right up in here just popped on my chin, which is crazy to me. I'm actually not shocked because I'm about to be 39 in a month. About to be 39 in a month. Y'all clapping. I'm scared. Y'all, that means 40 is right around the corner playing peekaboo, okay? About to be 40. 40 years old. Man, that's why I'm sitting down today. I got to be careful. This is crazy. They, they say that in your 20s, in your 20s, you're obsessed with what other people think about you. In your 40s, you stop caring what other people think about you. And then in your 60s, you realize, what well, nobody thinking about you anyway. <laughs> and so I'm entering into that season of, I don't care what you think about me. I don't know if I'm all the way there yet, but I can say that I'm in a season of life where I have great clarity about my priorities. Oh, my priorities in this season of life are crystal clear. I mean, so clear. As a matter of fact, uh, I have to tell you, uh, you are probably, and I love this church. I love pastor in this church. But y'all about number four on my priority list. I hope that doesn't offend you, but get over it. Uh, <laughs> y'all about number four on my priority list because I'm coming to the fundamental understanding that I am, number one, a child of God. Number two, husband to Taylor Madhu. Number three, father of the Madhu crew, my three little nuggets. And then number four, the pastor of Social Dallas. That order is very important to me. That's a priority. That's a priority. I first have to start with the paramount foundational understanding that I am a child of God first. I am a child of God first. That my worth, my significance, my value is not predicated or contingent upon how many shouts I get in a sermon, how many likes I get on a YouTube page, or how many claps you give me. My worth and my value is predicated upon the fact that Jesus died for me. He thought I was worth giving his life for, that I've been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb. I'm a child of God. Oh, that's good news. That gives, that's good news. Number two, I am a husband to Taylor Madhu. One woman, that woman right there in them leather pants. Can you stand up real quick? I am her husband right there. That is, she's like, hey, please stop. No, I wanted you to stand because I am her husband. That is my bride right there. That is my bride. Y'all are not my bride. 
Guess whose bride you are? His. He, you are the bride of Christ. I'm going to let you know right now, I ain't about to mess up my relationship with this bride trying to take care of this bride right here. I love y'all, but I, I, I'm at best the best man just trying to show you who your groom is. You are the bride of Christ. And then, whoo, my kids, my kids, they're number three on the list. And the reason they're number three on the list because these three, you got a picture of them right there? Ooh, these three right here? Oh, y'all saying all, oh, but you need to pray. <laughs> because of all the things on the list, I need the most prayer for raising those three. Oh yeah, I don't, I don't even need prayer for leading the church. I mean, I'll take it, but I'm saying God already told me I'm gonna build my church in the gates of hell. I will not, will not prevail against it. He didn't say nothing about building them kids. We got to build those kids and we're doing everything in our power to instill godly principles and a biblical worldview and y'all need to break us as hard out here for parents. We're in a season right now, especially with their ages seven, six, and five. We are trying to work on forgiveness and kindness. Forgive, it's a fight every day. Forgiveness and kindness. And I'll be honest, my daughters are good. Remy and Evie, oh, they are good, quick to forgive, quick to love. My son, Robert Madu the third, this dude, he is the fresh prince of petty. I have never in my life seen a kid that will hold a grudge like him. I don't know where he gets it from. He holds, he holds grudges. So I'm trying to work with him saying, Bubba, say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's just all an issue all the time. They had a fight a couple months ago. They got into it. I, I said, Bubba, come down here. We got to talk, okay? In this house, that's how parents do. They hit you with, in this house, we are kind. We are kind and we forgive. He said, okay. And he went upstairs. And I thought everything was good and settled until he came back downstairs. Ooh, and what he did when he came back downstairs made me laugh. I wish I could show it to you. Actually, I can. I'm a millennial parent. I record everything. I got to show you <laughs> what this boy did after I told him to apologize to his sisters and be kind. Watch, watch this. Watch this. How do I say goodbye to what we have? The good time that made us laugh I'll wake back I thought we could look back like you ain't gonna stop me <laughs> oh my dog was like ain't nothing out there in them streets for you come on back come on back <laughs> oh he made it all the way to the mailbox came right back came right back come on you've been there before come on how many be honest be honest anybody as a kid ever get offended get mad and pack the bag pack the bag come on I did too it's just not on tape got mad got offended and isn't it crazy his natural response was, I'm packing and I'm leaving. It's funny when you're a kid. It's cute when you do it as a child. It's not so cute when you're doing it grown up. Can I ask you a personal question today? What do you do when other people offend you? What do you do when other people offend you? What is your natural response to an offense? Do you pack up a bag and leave? Are you still packing up bags and leaving when somebody offends you? No wonder you on marriage number six. I just want to know, what is your natural reaction to being offended? Oh, do you stay, but you leave emotionally? I'm fine. No, I'm not mad. It's okay. But internally, you have packed a bag and left. I want to know today, what do you do when you get offended? Do you just pay them back? Disrespect me or disrespect you? You come at me wrong, I'm going to come at you wrong. You Old Testament, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. <laughs> do you know why that was actually implemented? And thank God for Jesus who says no longer an eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth, but actually turn the other cheek. But do you know why an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth was implemented in the Old Testament? It's because of the danger of revenge. They had to put some boundaries to revenge because whenever somebody offends us, we feel like they 
owe us. And the natural reaction is not just to do what they did to you, but to actually go further. So you cut off my finger, I'm going to cut off your whole arm. And so because of the human proclivity to do that, they actually said, hold on, if somebody takes your eye, all you can do is take their eye back. But grace actually says, do something completely opposite. I want to know today, what do you do when you get offended? Do you passive aggressively post on social media? Is that what you do? Just get on social media. Oh, I just want to say today, there's a whole lot of backstabbers out there. Really wish you could trust people, but you can't trust anybody. Ain't no real people today. Is that what you, is that what you do? <laughs> oh, you ain't even passive aggressive with it. You just put their name. I just want to let you know you can't trust Sabrina, okay? I gave her $35. I still ain't got my money back. How do you, how do you respond to offenses? Oh, do you just keep rehearsing what they did over and over again? Like somebody binge watching a Netflix episode over and over again to the point that it has become a cantankerous cesspool of bitterness and anger and wrath on the inside of you. This is why the Apostle Paul says, don't let the sun go down on your anger or your wrath. Wrath. You know why he says don't let the sun go down on your anger, your wrath? Do you know that word wrath is actually where we also get the word wreath? It's, it's showing us that anger, when you keep it on the inside, it twists you like a wreath. It has another word for it, not even just a wreath. It's wraith, where we get our word ghost. Because whenever you hold on to the offense of somebody else, they might be out of your life, but they're still there as a ghost. And yeah, you broke up with them 10 years ago, but every relationship, they're still there because you're still holding on to the offense. We're just talking today. What, what do you do when you get offended? Do you go ruin their reputation to somebody else? Say, hey, I just want to let you know about them. Let me, let me tell you what they did to me. Never mind going to them. Let me go to a person that's connected with to them and let me ruin their reputation and let somebody else know what they did to me. And I'll do it under the fake guise of protecting that person from them. Wow. Isn't the human mind funny? You will convince yourself that slander is honor. I'm just, I'm just letting you know that you can't trust them because of what they did to me. Now, of all the aforementioned responses, can I just say you are entitled to all of them. Matter of fact, do it. Post about them this afternoon. For real. Just stop calling yourself a believer if you do it. Because there's actually a biblical way to respond to offenses. There is a biblical way. Do you know a verse that I don't hear anybody talking about today? It's a powerful verse. If we would just implement this verse right here, revival would break out in the church. If we just did this verse right here, I'm telling you, lives would be changed, homes would be healed. If we just did this verse right here, can we look at it? Matthew 18, verse 15. If another believer sins, again, believers, sins against you, go on Instagram and blast them publicly. My bad. I am reading bad today. If another believer sins against you, please go live on Facebook and... Y'all, my bad. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. There is a biblical way to respond to offenses that when I am offended, my first response is to actually come to you. Ooh, you should see some of y'all's faces right now. I knew I wasn't going to get a whole lot of amends on this message. Because I see what you're saying. I'm there. I've been there like, I don't want to go to them. They should come to me. They should know they offended me. They should know they hurt me. Oh, I'm sorry. That's not the biblical way. The biblical way says when you offend me, not in pride, but actually in humility of restoration and perhaps reconciliation, I'm supposed to come to you first and say, this is what happened. Hey, this hurt me. And then if you don't listen, then I go get another two. And then we try to do it in the spirit of meekness and humility. But we have a new generation that has confused courage with cowardice. And we would rather type and think we tough because we type it. 
think we strong because we hit sin. That'll teach them. <laughs> Instead of going to the person and saying, I'm hurt. Ladies and gentlemen, I felt it was incumbent upon me to preach this message because I'm learning that we are now more than ever living in the age and the era of offense. Have you noticed? Offense is the emotion of the day. Everybody is perpetually and continually and consistently offended about everything all the time. I don't know about you. That's why I have to take social media breaks because I don't have the emotional energy to be mad about everything every day. Have you ever, it's like in our generation, what are we mad about today, y'all? <laughs> what are we picketing about today? It is almost this thing where we have become addicted to anger and become addicted to getting offended. We need that empowerment of I am so mad. Everybody is offended today. Men are offended. The women are offended. The Democrats are offended. The Republicans are offended. The old people are offended. The young people are offended. Offended. Baby boomers are offended. Millennials are offended. Gen X is offended. Gen Z is offended. The C H R I S T I A N are offended. The L G B T Q I A plus are offended. Everybody, Cowboys fans are offended. We all offended. We may as well just call this the U S O. We living in the United States of offense. Everybody has something to pick it about and shout about. And I'm wondering as believers, have we played into the trick of the culture to be offended about everything all the time? Please understand, this is a sign that Jesus' return is imminent. Ooh, in Matthew chapter 24, something interesting happens. The disciples come to Jesus and they say, hey, how can we know we are coming back? Jesus like, let us know. You've been saying you're going to leave and come back. Give us the blues clues of your return. And Jesus gives them a litany of things. He says, let no one deceive you. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. He says, nation will rise up against nation. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes in diverse places and famine and disease and pestilences. And when you're reading Matthew chapter 24, you can get lost in all the earthquakes and all the diseases and all the pestilence that you almost breeze past Matthew 24 verse 10 that he says, oh, and many will be offended. In other words, one of the signs that Jesus' return is imminent is that there will be a culture of outrage and offense. Luke chapter 17, something awesome happens. Jesus almost calls a huddle for his disciples because he's trying to prepare them to take the baton. They're going to be next. He's about to make his exit. And I love it because Jesus knows that he has got to pass this on to them and he knows how they are. He knows Peter's mouth. He know Peter going to pop off and say something. He know Matthew is a tax collector. He going to be about the budget and somebody going to mess up on the budget and they're going to order more fish than they were supposed to order and somebody's going to go off. He knows Judas is about to leave and he understands that your greatest threat is not what's outside of you. Your greatest threat is going to be your unity. The world is not afraid of a big church. The world is afraid of a united church. If the church could actually just get together, if we could just get on one accord, we would be unstoppable. I'm not scared of the enemy. I'm not scared of the devil. That is not our greatest enemy. Our greatest enemy is turning on each other and allowing a spirit of offense to creep in our hearts to the point that we can't stand the people that have been called to run alongside us. So in Luke 17, he's like, let me talk to y'all real quick. Look at what he says. He says uh, to his disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come. Ooh, that made me pause right there. That made me pause. Because you have a God that does the impossible saying something is impossible. Wow. What in the world could be impossible, Jesus? Healing the sick, raising the dead, the Cowboys winning the Super Bowl? No, all that is easy. Here is what is impossible. It is impossible that no offenses should come. In other words, Jesus is guaranteeing it that offense is going to come your way. He is letting you know beforehand somebody going to say something sideways to you that's going to make you feel some type of way. He's letting you know ahead of time your spouse is going to get on your last nerve. He's letting you know that somebody's going to get ready to respond to your text and you're going to see them three bubbles and then they're going to disappear and they're going to say anything back to that text and you're going to be mad and then they're going to have the nerve to say, I didn't get it. Yes, you did because you left me on red. 
He's guaranteeing you that offenses are coming. He guarantees you somebody's going to see you turn into that parking lot at Gillies and they know you had your turn signal on and they're going to squeeze right in front of you in the parking lot and you're going to do everything in your power not to give them another kind of wave in the church parking lot. He's letting you know offenses are inevitable and this might seem like a point to just skip past but if you don't understand that offenses are inevitable you've already lost the battle if you don't understand that it is going to come your way you have already lost the battle and the first step is understanding that offenses are inevitable they are going to come your way if you are going to run the race that God has set before you please know that offenses are going to come along the way it's interesting the Bible says that we're to run the race that's been set before us and that we have a great cloud of witnesses around us oh I love that I love the idea that as we're down here running our race Father Abraham hair is up there saying go social go social go go social go social go and Moses is over there going oh say I let I said let my people go but they better go look at them at Gillies and at Winspear turning the city of Dallas upside down y'all better run your way oh it's a beautiful thing that we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses and we're running our race that's encouraging and I've often said that as you're running your race how many know this is not a sprint this is a marathon Oh, please believe me when I tell you Christianity, it is a marathon, not a sprint. How many of you know God wants to see, can you make it the long run? Anybody can jump up and down and say anything is possible for six months at church, but can you keep going and keep going even when you don't feel like it? Can you stay faithful even when the feeling is gone? Can you stay committed even when you don't feel like being committed? How many of you know this is not a sprint, this is a marathon? And I want to pause right here and thank God that the race is not given to the swift or to the strong but the race is given to the one who endures to the end let me just take a praise break and thank God that my running is not in vain that I cannot stop until I get to heaven and he says well done my good and faithful servant that's why I can't quit that's why I preach whether I feel like it or not because I'm running a race that's not predicated upon my speed it's built on my endurance Oh, see, I thought the right of that praise is that are praising right there. Some of y'all too much in your feelings, and no wonder you about to quit. You better have some fortitude. You better have some tenacity to say, come hell or high water, I'm going to keep on running my race. <laughs> I'm sorry. I said I was going to chill today. I'm almost 40. Let me calm down. We're running the race, and it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. But I think I messed up the metaphor talking about a marathon because some of you have the imagery of this open track and we just running our race. That is not the race we're running. Can I show you what it looks like? This is what it really looks like to run the race God has set before you. It is. <laughs> it is a race with the fences. It is a race the all throughout your life, I don't care how saved you are, you could have floated in here and had communion for breakfast. I promise you, as you're running the race God has set before you, you're going to run into some hurdles. Some hurdles, some, some hurt. Oh, some offenses. And as soon as you run into those offenses, a decision is placed in front of you. Am I going to stand here Staring? How could they say that about me? <laughs> well, I'm gonna be so committed to what's ahead of me that I won't let what's in front of me stop me. I feel some of you, and I can feel the tension in the room. I need all my intercessors praying because I feel some of you in here who have had legitimate hurts and offenses, and you're like, I'm still not over it. And that's fine. But I'm just telling you, you're going to waste years of your life stuck in front of a hurdle that God wanted you to step over. It's interesting. Jesus says it is impossible that no offenses should come. But he did not say that it is impossible for you not to get offended. Because there's a difference between an offense and offended. Now teach the Bible. I'm going to teach. There's a difference between an offense and being offended. See, an offense is what happened. Offended is a reaction. An offense says, you did it. Offense
ended says, I will never forgive it. One writer said it like this, an offense is an event. Offended is a decision. You make a decision to be offended. So the question is not our offense is going to come. Offenses are inevitable. But being offended is optional. And if offenses are inevitable, being offended is optional. That means it's actually plausible and possible for you to live your life unoffendable. That God is actually looking for some believers now more than ever that actually look different from the culture and are not offended offended easily. Oh, can I ask you another question? What is your current level of offendability? No, for what does it take for you to get offended? I'll never forget when God started birthing this word in me and speaking to me about this issue of offense. He said to me so clearly, Robert, your current level of offendability is way too high. I said, excuse me, Lord? What you talking about my current level of offendability is too high? I do not get easily offended, Lord. What are you talking about? <laughs> I started getting offended that God told me I got easily offended. How many know Jesus knows how to offend you too? Ooh, not only people offend you, Jesus can, if Jesus has never offended you, you don't have relationship with Jesus. He can't help but offend you. Jesus cannot read your Bible. He was always offending people. He couldn't help but offend you. You know why? Because he is the way, he is the Oh, you said it, not me. The truth and the life. He is the truth often offends before it transforms and changes. So ultimately, sometimes when Jesus comes in your life with the truth of who you really are, it will offend you. But don't let the events make you walk away. Let it make you seek him so you can be transformed to the image of his dear son and look like him. Oh, I never forget it. He said, you are too easily offended. And he began to remind me, he said, Robert, I got big things in store for you. Massive things in store for you. Things that your eyes have not seen and your ears have not heard. I got big things in store for you, but you'll never be able to handle the big thing if it keeps taking the smallest thing for you to get offended. What does it take for you to get offended? So sometimes I'm dealing with the offenses of other people. And sometimes I'm dealing with the offenses of Jesus. And the question of every offense is I'm going to stand here and say I'm still not over it? Or am I going to get over it and go toward what's ahead? My text today is very intriguing because Jesus is in Gentile territory. In Matthew chapter 15, you have to read the tension in the text when it says that Jesus left that place and went to Tyre and Sidon. You have to feel the tension in the text because Tyre and Sidon is Gentile territory. So you got a Jewish Jesus with his Jewish disciples going into Gentile territory. Can you imagine the look on their faces when Jesus is like, uh, let's pull up to Tyre and Sidon? For what? Y'all, this is, whoo, this is a Republican going to the Democratic National Convention. This is a Democrat going to a MAGA rally. This is the tension in the text. I'm trying to bring it to current day. I can see the faces of the disciples going, why are we going to a place I've been avoiding? I love Jesus. I love field trips with Jesus because Jesus will move you out of your comfort zone. Jesus will take you places you don't want to go. Y'all ain't going to clap. That's cool. I love that Jesus is more committed to the call that's on your life than he is to the comfort of your life. So often he will call you out of the places that you like. He'll call you away from the places you feel are good and he will bring you into a place sometimes that you don't even want to go. I can see him laughing like, yeah, come on, y'all. It's cool. Come to Tyre and Sidon. And as soon as they get in there, they already feel some type of way being there because it's a place they avoided their entire life. But they were committed to following him. And so they follow him and there they are in the house and in the middle of Gentile territory in a place they don't even want to be. All of a sudden, a certain house, pew, the door opens and a Canaanite woman comes in the room and she runs up to Jesus and she says, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. Ooh, when I get to heaven, I want to meet sister girl. 
I want to meet her because I want to talk to her about the resolve and the fortitude it took to walk into a room with these Jewish disciples. Do you know how long the Canaanites and the Israelites couldn't stand each other? Oh, I wish I could talk to her and say, girl, what made you walk in that room? Come on, some of y'all have been there before. Have you ever had to walk into a room and you knew the people in the room hated you? But you had to walk in there anyway (laughs) because your check was in there. You're like, forget y'all. I got to get my check. Come on. Now, yeah, whatever. (laughs) Can you imagine the fortitude it took? Can you imagine what she had to endure just to walk into that room and deal with their scoffs, to deal with their looks of disdain? Oh, what would make a Canaanite woman walk into a room with a Jewish Messiah and his Jewish disciples that didn't even want to be in her part of town? Oh, I'll tell you what made her walk up in that room. The devil was messing with her daughter. The devil was messing with her child. And how many know there is some pain and some hell that you go through in life that'll make you move past your offenses? See, some of y'all hadn't been through nothing. That's why you easily offended. But some of us got some issues in our life that'll make us move past our feelings and our offenses because we actually need a miracle more than we want to be stuck in our feelings. Oh, sometimes it's good for you to go through some desperation. Sometimes it's good for you to go through pain because that pain actually helps you stop being petty. Look at this woman. The hell in her home forced her to find Jesus. Oh, I don't know who this is for. That's why you pulled up on Gillies today. You know you don't ever come to church. You was real good when you got the raise six months ago. But now life has hit you in the face and you're going through hell. And look at you in church on a Sunday morning. And I want to thank God for his grace and his sovereignty. Because sometimes God will let you go through hell if the hell will draw you to him. Look at this pagan woman. She don't even got a relationship with God. But she's talking about Lord, son of David. Oh, there is some pain that will hit your life that atheists will talk about Jehovah Jireh. I need your help right now. That's why they say is that God whispers to us in our pleasures, but he shouts at us in our pain. I don't know who this is for today, but that pain, that hell you're going through, let it drive you to the presence of Jesus, because that's what it did for this woman. She said, Lord, son of David, Have mercy on me, my baby girl. I am convinced that if she was going through the issue, she wouldn't have walked in that room. But the fact it was her child, that's what made her walk in that room. All the parents make some noise up in here real quick. I didn't know this till I had kids myself. It's one thing for you to come for me. It's a whole nother thing for you to come for my child. I don't care how spiritual somebody is. They could have the most docile, chill, calm personality. Mess with their kid and see what comes out of them. I'm telling you, somebody messing with your kid will make you low kick an eighth grader on a playground. I wish you would bully my kid again. Come on, get your backpack. I wish you would do it again. <laughs> Devil was messing with her daughter. He said, roll your eyes if you want, Peter. Look at me crazy all you want. I'm tired of being up at night. I'm tired of dealing with this. And she comes to the most compassionate, loving Savior. The one who at the mention of his name, demons tremble. Oh, she came to the right place. But do you notice his response? She is begging for her daughter. And Jesus pulls out his phone and starts scrolling on TikTok. I mean, that's not what the text says, but he may as well have been because it's in verse 23. She's begging and Jesus' response to a woman begging about her demon-possessed daughter is this. In verse 23, Jesus did not answer a word. The silent treatment. Have you ever been there before where you cried out to God and he didn't say yes? And he didn't say no. But all he did was hit you with the offense of being ignored. Oh, this is a difficult offense to deal with. I am convinced that I would rather be rejected than ignored. Because at least when you reject me, I know where we stand. But 
when you ignore me, when I'm crying out to you and I don't hear anything at all from you, somebody knows what it's like to cry out to God and say, God, why aren't you saying anything? And if you're truly honest, you're offended at God because you're saying, God, I know your character. I know you're a healer. And I'm crying out to you to heal my body. Why haven't you healed my body? God, I know you are Jehovah Jireh, my provider, but how come I can't get a job? I'm filling out every application I know. I'm not lazy, God, but wouldn't you open up a door when I know you can do it? Somebody knows what it's like to feel like you are ignored by God. And maybe not just ignored by God. Maybe you're offended because you're ignored by other people. Oh, I'm convinced. This is the biggest offense of our generation right now. The feeling of being ignored. You know why? Because we have a generation that has made attention our new idol. Have you noticed? (laughs) Everybody needs attention today. Everybody is fiending for likes and comments. Did you see my post? Did you see my blog? Did you see my podcast? Are you following me? Did you see what I just dropped? Did you know my ebook is coming out? Did you know my new book is coming out? Did you know my course is coming out on this? Would you like to take my coaching class? Would you like to take my relationship class? Would you like? Everybody wants attention. And in a culture that is obsessed with attention, the moment nobody gives it to us, we immediately feel like we are ignored and we are insignificant and we have no value at all. Oh, this is tough to deal with. It took me back to my childhood. My dad, who was here, I'll never forget growing up as a child, my Nigerian father. Whoo, the feeling of being ignored. I would hit him when I was like 16. I'd be like, Dad, hey, there's a party uh, next week, next Friday at a house with people you don't know. It's going to end like at 1 a.m. Can I go to the party? I'm grown, obviously. And my dad, he would be, I could see it like yesterday. He'd be reading the paper and I'd ask something like that. And he would just, after I asked something like that, he would just lower the newspaper down. (laughs) He would just look at me and his face would let me know, I heard the stupid thing you just said. (laughs) But he would just look at me and then right after looking at me, he would just go right back to reading the paper again. (laughs) Make me so mad because I know you heard me. So why are you ignoring me? The offense of being ignored is painful to deal with. If it was me, the moment Jesus ignored me, I would have been out. Oh, I would have been out. I'm like, oh, oh, you can't speak. Savior of the world, but you can't speak to nobody. Oh, no, it's cool. It's cool. Wait till I do my YouTube channel and I talk about you. I'm going to do a whole post about how you don't talk to people. That would have been me, but not this woman. She kept asking. She kept seeking. She kept saying, please, 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 Lord. Please, 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 Lord. It's there in the Greek. She kept begging and begging. Do you know how crazy you look to keep talking to somebody that's ignoring you? And I found out every once in a while, God will give you the silent treatment because he wants to see, are you desperate enough to keep seeking? Are you desperate enough to stay persistent? Do you realize that I am God? I'm not Amazon Prime. I want to know, will you humble yourself and just seek me and seek me? Who is this for today? God told me to tell you that you quit too soon. You gave up too soon and God wants to know, will you keep seeking him? Even when he's silent and you can't get anything back. This woman kept seeking. I would have left, but she kept asking and she didn't get a response from Jesus, but she did get a response from his constituents, the disciples, his staff. Look at what these fools say. Jesus is steady ignoring They feel like they got to speak for Jesus. And look what they say. Send her away. For she keeps crying out after us. What? Hold up. Hold up, disciples. Where in the text did this woman cry out for Matthew, Bartholomew? When does anybody cry out for Bartholomew? He don't ever get a shout out. When did she say, Peter, ain't nobody crying out for you? Oh, this for all the church people and the church staff people. Please don't get it twisted. Sometimes when you've been in close proximity with Jesus, you think people are crying out after you. Don't nobody want you. We actually need you to get out the way so we can see him. You can't save anybody. You can't heal anybody. You can't deliver anybody. I need the one who came from heaven to earth and paid the price that nobody else could pay. And sometimes if you would shut up and get out of the way, I could get to him. Oh, you got to watch out for disciples sometimes. You got to watch out for disciples that get a title. 
because they've been with him for two years now. They were super humble at first. Oh, you really, you want us? We just, we just fishermen. You want us? That's how they were when they first got called. Just like you, when you first started serving in church, I'm just so glad to be serving. But now it's been a couple of years. Now you got sunglasses on. So y'all better be glad I'm even here. No, I got a blue check. Never mind, I bought it. I got a blue check now. Now you got sunglasses on inside. And you think people want you? Send her away. Are you bothered, Messiah? I am. Send her away. She keeps crying out after us. It's the us that makes me mad. (laughs) This is the offense. Oh, of the institution of the church. Isn't it crazy that the same disciples that should be reflecting the nature and the character of God had the nerve to be sending people away? This is the offense of the institution of the church. And that is really the cry that I hear all the time of people who don't have a problem with Jesus. They just got a problem with the people that represent him. I mean, you hear it? Deconstruction? And church hurt. And hear me, as somebody who leads the church and loves the church, the church has got to do better. I am not dismissing some of the ridiculous things that we have seen in churches, and particularly with pastors and leaders. But I also need you to see that it is a diabolical scheme and trick of the enemy to get you to walk away from the church just because somebody in the church hurt you. Ladies and gentlemen, there are no perfect churches. And if you find it, please don't join it because you'll jack it up. Because you are jacked up too. It is not an excuse for toxic cultures, but you got to see the scheme of the enemy. He will do whatever he can to get you in isolation and away from community. And that's why so many people are quick to say, well, it's my church hurt. It's my church. You don't see nobody else say, I I got corporate America hurt. I've never heard that term. I've never heard of, I, I'm so sorry, I'm just really dealing with Best Buy hurt. Can you cut off your electronic device? No, I got Target hurt. Don't wear that red shirt around me. I'm easily triggered. Can I t- it's only the church <laughs> that we want to castigate the whole entity and the whole institution just because some people in the church didn't reflect the character of God. If this was me, and Jesus ignored me, and the disciples tried to shoo me, Oh, I would have been out. I would have been out. I probably would have punched Peter on the way out. (laughs) Send me away. I would have been gone. Not this woman. Not this woman. She stayed. Matter of fact, she changed her posture. The Bible says she got on her knees. And she said, Lord, help. Lord, help. She worshiped. She went from asking to worship. From asking to worship, she humbled herself and put herself in the position of worship and said, Lord, please, Lord, please, can I tell you the challenge with so many of us is that we bring our entitlement into our faith and we think that God actually owes us something. And how many know God does not owe us anything? He gave you everything when he gave you his life on the cross. But many of us have forgotten the posture of humility that just says, Lord, please, you don't owe me anything, but please, I'm going to worship. I know they treated me bad and I could have walked away, but instead I'm going to worship. Can I tell you, you know you are right on the edge of a breakthrough when you could have walked away, but instead of walking away, you said, I'm going to worship. You know you are on the edge of God doing something miraculous in your life when you could have wrote a blog and you could have told him off, but instead you found yourself in a secret place and say, God, you are my defender. God, you are my judge. If I stand up for me, I'm robbing you of an opportunity for you to fight my battle, so I'm just going to change my posture and and worship. It's easy to walk away. It's easy to quit. It's easy to say, believe me when I tell you, it's easy to say, forget all of this, man. It's not worth it. The difficult thing to do is even with the offenses, even after feeling ignored, even after the church hurt, can you find a posture of worship and trust the God that sees you when nobody else sees you? 
she worshiped. I'm sure she wanted to leave, but she was too desperate. She just worshiped him. And here's what I love because she stayed, he spoke. He spoke. It wasn't until she changed her posture and worship that Jesus actually spoke. I don't know who that's for, but you left too soon. You let the offenses drive you away, but I'm telling you, there's something about staying and being planted and worshiping that postures your heart and your ears to hear the voice of Jesus. Now, I do have to warn you, when he does speak, he might not tell you what you want to hear. He might tell you you were wrong. Are you even open to that? I'm blown away by the arrogance of people today who are not even open to the fact I was wrong. It was me. That was my bad. It was me. Look at what Jesus, the first words of Jesus to this woman, look at what he says to her. He says, even as she's worshiping, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Let me translate that for you. Girl, I ain't here for you. As she's worshiping, he has the nerve to let the first words to this woman be, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the offense of insignificance. You mean to tell me that because I'm a Gentile and I'm not a Jew, you're not here for me? That is what the human heart can't handle. It's to make me feel like I'm less than. It is the offense of insignificance. He says it so clear. I am here for the house of Israel first. Now, this is why whenever offenses come in our life, perspective is important. Because whenever you are offended, you become blinded by that offense. And you look at everything and that person through the lens of the offense. And how many you know that's why every time you tell the story, you are the victim and that other person is the villain. Have you noticed how offenses blind you to another perspective? And that's why it's always pride behind defense. Because humility is actually open to somebody else coming in and saying, actually, you shouldn't have responded that way. Actually, you shouldn't have done that. Actually, you never even expressed that expectation. It's perspective. So from her perspective, it's insignificance. You said you're only here for the lost sheep of Israel. But from Jesus' vantage point, it is not insignificance. It's actually precedence. Jesus says, I have a mission, and my mission is first to the house of Israel, first to the Jew, and then to the Gentile, but I got to come to the Jew first. That's why Paul said, I feel like preaching, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, first to the Jew, and then to the Gentile. He said, I got to come for the Jew first, and then to the Gentile. But when you are arrogant, and you don't take precedence, you'll feel like you're insignificant. Come on, it's the equivalent of like spraining your ankle. Can you imagine spraining your ankle and going to the hospital? And you go to the hospital because you sprained your ankle and you think you broke it. And as they're looking at your ankle, somebody with a gunshot wound to the head comes in the hospital. And because the person with the gunshot wound comes in, they throw you a bag of ice and they start working on the person that just got shot in the head. How stupid would you look in the hospital? Oh, really? Y'all just, what about my ankle? You don't care about me? See, I'm leaving this hospital. Y'all don't love anybody. How crazy would you look? And they would look at you and say, no, boo-boo. We're not saying you're insignificant. We're just saying this person that got shot in the head must take precedence. And Jesus' first assignment was to the house of Israel, and they had to take precedence because their religion had blinded them from the need of grace. It's the offense of insignificance. If this was me, oh, I would have been gone after the first offense. But not this woman. She kept pressing. And look at what Jesus says lastly to her. He says to her, this is the one that's scary to read. It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. 
Y'all, this is a text that preachers don't want to preach because it's hard to articulate and try to exegete the fact that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords called this woman a dog. But before you run out the church, please understand context matters. Context matters. And what's interesting is Jesus is actually playing into what is happening in that culture. In that culture, Jews called Gentiles dogs. Dogs were outside. That's what they called them. This is the offense of being insulted. If you look at this on the surface, it looks like the king of the universe, the compassionate father, insulted this woman by calling her a dog, just like every other Jewish person would have done in that culture in that day, calling her a dog. And I have the strange suspicion that maybe in this woman's mind, after this last offense, maybe in her mind, she was ready to walk away. She said, I've tried everything. I've been ignored. I've been made to feel insignificant. I've been hurt by your own disciples. I got to walk away. But here's what you don't hear in the Greek. Jesus doesn't use the term dog that every other Jew used. They use the term dog to denote a wild dog. Jesus uses a term that denotes a pet dog. So I think this woman was about to roll out until she realized, wait a minute, all the other Jews call us Gentiles wild dogs, but you call me a pet dog. What? Well, you call me a pet dog because I mean, you know, there is a difference between a wild dog and a pet dog I'd rather you not call me a dog but if y'all gonna call me a dog call me at least a pet dog because there's a difference between a wild dog and a pet dog how many know a wild dog does not have a home a wild dog doesn't have shelter a wild dog when the rain comes and the wind blows a wild dog's got to find a bridge or just got to find some random spot but not a pet dog a pet dog has a place in the home a pet dog has its own little house has its own little cushion y'all acting like you ain't dog owners you know how you do it your pet dog they have their own place there's a difference between a wild dog and a pet dog. a wild dog has has to go through the trash to find scraps and get food. A wild dog has to find whatever's laying on the street, but not a pet dog. A pet dog is always going to eat as good as the master. Ah, that means if the master's eating steak and shrimp, that pet dog going to get some steak and shrimp. If the master's eating good, that pet dog's going to eat good. A wild dog doesn't have a name. You can call that dog whatever you want, but a pet dog has a name. A pet dog has an identity that was given to it by the master by the one that owns it oh I think it hit her in the head she said I see why you calling me a pet dog because maybe it has nothing to do with you calling me a dog but everything to do with who my master is oh as long as you my master I got every single thing that I need if you're my master the crumbs that come from the table of Jesus are enough this woman didn't allow the offenses to stop her she said call me whatever you want I just want you to be my master call me whatever you want as long as you're my master I got every single thing that I need as long as you're my master just a crumb that falls from the table of the master of Jesus is enough for my healing is enough for my breakthrough I got to close this message but I came to tell somebody that is stuck at the offense that stuck at the father who was never there that stuck at the mom that never gave you the validation that you needed that stuck at the co-worker that keeps talking about you that stuck at the business partner that stared you in the back you can if you want just stand there and look at the hurdle and say I'm still not over it but God told me to tell you today if you would actually trust him and just take a step and get over every single person that ignored you I don't need validation from you I need validation from the one who loves me the one that calls me his own who can get over all of the church hurt yes the church hurt people but can you keep your eyes on the beautiful Savior can you get over all the people that made you feel insignificant and say I am who God says that I am can you get over being insulted and say God I'm gonna keep my eyes on you you were insulted on a cross but you said father forgive them they know nothing
not what they do. You can say I'm still not over it, but you're gonna be stuck on this side of your purpose. Some of you have delayed your destiny for years because you've been stuck at the hurdle. God told me to tell you if you would just step over it, your miracle is on the other side of your offense. Oh, I wish you caught this. Your miracle is on the other side of your offense. When was her daughter healed? At which moment? At the moment she got over every single one of those offenses. You know what I love about this miracle? Is this miracle was right behind this curtain the whole time. I put this miracle back there before service even started today. Y'all were up here worshiping and didn't even know there was a hidden miracle. There was a hidden miracle behind the stage. But I made it a point not to grab the miracle until I got over every single one of these offenses. And I came to tell you, God has a miracle that has been waiting on you, but you've got to get over the hurt. Hear me. I am not downplaying what they did. I'm not saying the offense was right. Oh, hear me today. There are some people who have gone through some serious offenses. I'm not talking about the people that have brittle feelings and everything is an offense. There are some of you who have some real hurts, real pains, real trauma. And I am not saying that what they did was right. I'm not even going to take away your right to be angry. But I do just want to posit this question. Do you want to be offended more than you want your miracle? Because God will often put your miracle on the other side of an offense and he wants to know, do you have the courage to forgive and let it go? And if you have put your faith in Jesus and our faith is built on a man who hung on a cross, who truly did no wrong. He was the only one who said, I didn't do anything and could truly say that. Come on, get out of your pride. We all have sin. We all have hurt other people. You are not innocent. How many of you know he was the only innocent one? Yet with his arms stretched out wide, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And if our Savior did not hold any of your offenses towards you, what right do we have to hold any offenses towards anybody else? I, I preach this message because I feel like our church is getting ready to step into the greatest season of miracles. I'm telling you, this is not just preacher hype. We are about to step into the greatest season of the miraculous. He's already doing a miracle, but how many of you know, this is not the full picture. This is just the beginning. We are about to step in the season of miracles in this season of May. We may as well call it May, a month of miracles. But God reminded me of this word. That he'll often put your miracle on the other side of an offense so that you'll make a decision as to whether you're going to stay stuck where you are or whether you're going to say, God, I'm going to forgive and let it go because I want my miracle more than I want to be offended. Can I tell you, I was preparing for this message and God said so clearly, there's somebody you need to text and go to lunch with. It reminded me, I got to preach this stuff to me before I preach it to you. Somebody I hadn't talked to in two years because I had allowed offense to stay in my heart. And God said, before you step on that stage and preach this message on Sunday, text them and go to lunch. And I texted and was hoping they would say they were busy. And they were like, no, I can meet you. I was like, oh, okay. And had the most beautiful lunch. And watch this. Got perspective. Got perspective on stuff I have been holding for two years. This is the arrogance of offense. And some of you have an offense towards somebody that doesn't even know it, or you don't even have the full picture or story. And 
a miracle of healing happened in my heart this week. And I'm telling you, this is a message that is easy to shout about, but harder to live out in practicality when this service is over. But I came to tell you there's a miracle on the other side of your offense. And God's word to you today is to let it go. Stop saying, I'm still not over it. Instead, lift up your hands and say, God, help me. Help me to reflect your character. Help me say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Would you stand to your feet all over this place today? Worship team, can you come up here, please? This is a house of miracles. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to ask every head be bowed, eyes be closed. If you're in here today and you'd be so honest to say, hey, Pastor Robert, I know this is for me. I don't know who it is or what they did. I do know that your miracle is on the other side of the offense. Some of you have been holding on to it for years. And then you have the nerve to be mad at God as to why the miracle you've been believing for hasn't come to pass. And God says, today, if you'll let me, I'm going to give you the strength and the grace to step over every hurdle. It doesn't deny it. In some cases, it doesn't mean you're going to be back in relationship with that person, but it does mean in your heart, you say, if I serve a God who held none of my sins and my offenses against me, what right do I have to hold any offense towards anybody else? Father, thank you right now that you are giving us the grace to forgive, to forgive that mom, to forgive that dad, to forgive that school teacher. God, thank you today for the grace to forgive. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, but if you're in here today, you say, Pastor Robert, I know this is for me. And today I need that strength because you can't do this in your own strength. I need it to desire my miracle more than I want to be offended. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand high enough and long enough to where I could see it? Thank you, Jesus. Wow, wow. Hands are going up all over this place today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. You can lift it up and put it right back down. Thank you, God. I saw so many hands, and what I see are so many miracles that are about to break forth because God has given us right now a spirit of forgiveness instead of a spirit of offense. Anybody else? Lift it up, put it right back down. If you're here today and you say, hey, Pastor Robert, I've never surrendered my life to Jesus, but today, but today I need to give him my life. Hear me, you cannot forgive in your own strength. What gives us the strength to forgive is not looking at the hurdle or the offense. It's keeping your eyes fixed on the one who paid the price for your sin. It is our eyes fixed on Jesus and his finished work and what he did for us. It puts the pain in perspective. So you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. I want to give you that opportunity today. Would you lift up your hand high enough and long enough to where I can see you say, today's the day. I need to give him my life. I'm not asking you, have you had an encounter with church? I'm asking you, have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Maybe you allowed the church hurt to stop you and there was a season you were going after the things of God. But even right now, you hear your father saying, you can come home. You can come home. Anybody else lift it up and put it right back down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Here's what I want to do. If you lifted up your hand, that last time saying I need to give Jesus my life or I just feel like there's some of you and you would know who you are that you just know you need to take a step and respond to this message I love having a response to a message and leaving the seat where I am because something about moving my body is indicative of what's happening in my spirit. I just feel like for some of you, you need to leave that hurt and that offense at your seat. And as you take every single step up to this altar, you're saying, God, I'm trusting you for the next step. God, I don't want to be controlled by bitterness. I don't want a root of bitterness that can even lead to witchcraft to be in my heart. So some of you need to respond by giving them your 
your life, but some of you need to respond even by saying, God, today's the day I am letting it go. When I count to three, if that's you, I just want you to come up here to the front. Don't worry about what anybody else is going to think about you. Come on, this is about you and your miracle. This is about you and your healing. Come on, some people are already coming, but this is for you. If you know it's you, I want you to come. One, come on, this is your day. No more of that unforgiveness and bitterness. Two, come on, this is the moment God's saying, let it go. Three, I want you to come. I don't care if you're that far in the back. Maybe you're in the watch party room. Just walk to the front. I just want you to come. And I want us to sing that house of miracles. And as you come, can you just lift up your hands as a sign to say, God, I'm giving it to you. I don't want to hold on to that bitterness. I don't want to hold on to that unforgiveness. Today is the day I release it. I give it to you. I don't want to be my defender. I want you to be my defender, Jesus. This is a house. God, let your forgiveness flow from the front to the back, Lord. This is a house of We want our miracle more than we want to be offended. God, let dead things come back to life today. Let hearts that have become numb come back to life today. is going to flow through you. Come on. Come alive. In the name of Jesus. Come alive. Come alive. In the name of I am a house. I am a house of miracles. We bring everything, everything. to the feet of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus. Not only are you going to get your miracle, 
but you can become a conduit through which miracles come through. Anytime they need to get the serum for a snake bite, it's got to come from somebody that's been bitten by the same poisonous snake and survived it. They take the natural antibodies from the person that survived the snake bite and they use it to bring healing to other people that got bit by the snake. Please don't fall to the trick of the enemy. He wants you to give up and be hurt and say, I'm still not over. But I'm telling you, you can use the same thing that the enemy tried to take you out with and you can show somebody, this is how you still stand after the betrayal, after the rape, after the abuse, after the mental breakdown, after the drug addiction. You can still stand after having the father that was never there you can still be the father that shows up after having the mom that abused you can be a mom that shows love and grace but you'll never be able to say it if you got a closed fist saying i'm still not over it god wants you to give you the gift of releasing it today so come on, can we even just lift our hands all over this place just as a sign to say, God, our hands are lifted and open because we don't want to carry the unforgiveness. We don't want to carry the bitterness, God. God, we have too much purpose to be petty. You have too many big things for us for us to hold on to the little things. So with our hands raised, come on, can we just pray this prayer and say, Jesus, Thank you so much for loving me enough to pay the price for my sin, for my offenses. Jesus, because of you, because of the blood you shed on the cross, because you forgave me, I have the power to forgive. So Lord, today, I surrender all of me for all of you from this moment forward I'm trusting you for what's ahead I want my miracle more than I want to be offended and I will be a miracle to somebody else in Jesus name amen Amen, amen, amen. Come on, if you meant what you prayed, would you give God praise today? Come on, you could do better than that. You ought to praise like you're going to give the devil a nervous breakdown. Oh, come on, somebody had their praise robbed from unforgiveness. But you ought to just turn it back on the enemy right now and say, you took too many years of my praise.